Good morning, Rez. Good morning. It is good to be here with you. Thank you for braving the weather and coming out today. This is awesome to see God's house full, and we are here to worship the Lord. And I, I agree with Pastor Bernie. I love to see students come together. I, I was a youth pastor for many years, some of the favorite days of my life, uh, seeing teens come to know the Lord and grow in the Lord. And so I think we, again, need to celebrate what God has done here this weekend in the One Heart Conference and that teens were drawn to Christ. That's awesome. Thank you. As, as Bernie said, he's so right on. I feel home here, and I just thank so many of you for just being partners with us at Winning at Home, but also just for making me feel so welcome here. We just finished a cruise. As you know, uh, Ken and I did a cruise last week down to Cozumel, that kind of thing. There were several in here. I know several this morning in here were on that cruise, and I thank you for coming. I don't know if Ken's back yet. I think they kept him on the boat, but... Uh, we had a great time. We grew in. I see Andrea over there, so he's here. Well, is he back? They did let him come. Where's he at? Oh, he's right there. That's perfect. Nice to see you. He's a little darker, you can tell from the cruise. We had a lot of fun together, and we laughed together. Ken and I, we did a duet on the boat, which is really scary, but we had a lot of fun. He sings, and I stand there. But it was wonderful, and God bless our time. And I just felt the Lord leading me today as I was preparing to come back and, and to preach here at Res this morning. I just felt the Lord leading me into parenting idea. The last time I was here, you might remember we talked about just leveraging what you do here as parents and then what the church does uh, to really make a difference in the lives of our teens. And I spoke to the students. And so today, I thought it would be appropriate for me to share. Of course, I lead an organization called Winning at Home, and I wanted to talk a little bit about parenting and family life. And though you may not be a parent today, I believe there are principles in this passage that are going to give you tips and ideas just growing yourself in life. I'm going to interestingly use the life of Joseph and Mary because as I think about raising a child in the world that we live in, I, I don't know, I just think there would have been a lot of pressure raising Jesus. I mean, like God saying, hey, I'm going to give you Jesus. So there are some principles and tips from the life of Joseph and Mary that I want to share with you that I believe will resonate with your parenting and your life today. And before I even do that, though, I want to show you a little picture. As parents, we have this dream in our head when our children are born. They're, they're going to grow up, and they're going to be difference makers, and they're going to be obedient, and they're going to not give me any problems. And if you're here and you're a parent at all, if you're a parent, you've parented for 10 days, you get that that goes away. Uh, there's a little picture coming up on the screen of this mom who took her child to have it professionally, you know, picture taken, and we've seen these sort of things. And so there was another mom who was going to attempt to do this same picture at home. She liked it, and she thought, shoot, I can do that. So that's her picture. And that's what parenting feels like. You tried to nail it, and you nailed it. And I think as parents, if we could just this morning take some of the pressure off and realize we're going to do more like picture number two. We're flawed people, and we're going to make mistakes. You're looking at the king of it. I've parented for 108 years now because you add up all the age of my children. That's how long I parented. I'm counting every dog on one of them. And when you add it up, that's a lot of years, and you're looking at one flawed man. I have messed up far more than I would like to have to tell you. And I want to start today by sharing something with you that the Lord has really been laying on my heart as a parent. And I want you to get this concept and idea because Joseph and Mary were so effective at this. They, as I read the stories of the interactions they had with Jesus, which we'll share some of those today, uh, they were very relational. They were relatable and relational. They connected with the life of Jesus. And I think that one of the things we miss as parents is this. It's a really big thing here. Well, I, I, in fact, it happened. This is so interesting to me. It happened this morning with Bernie right here. When we watched that video, when he came up, he, he wasn't prepared. He was going to be emotional and cry and share that stuff. But we started watching that video. I'll tell you what happened to every one of us. All of a sudden, we went back to being that age a little bit. You ask an eighth grader, what would you enjoy? Uh, dodgeball. You know, nobody's going to leave the church this morning and catch you on the way. Hey, what did you enjoy this morning? I like the dodgeball. Hey, you didn't, you didn't, well, I like the worship. We're, we, we're older now. I like the way that one person walked across the stage. And we notice the older things. When you're an eighth grader, when you're six years old, when you're five, 
You don't see all the stuff adults see. You see kid stuff. And as parents, sometimes I think we forget that. So we say things to our five-year-olds like this. Why don't you get it? Because they can't. They're five. You're trying to tell them a 40-year-old concept. It took you 40 years to get it. He's five. You're teenagers. You look at them sometimes and you just go, what are you thinking? They're thinking what 16-year-olds think. You're old to them. You look near death to them. You look, you look like you're out of touch to them. And I want to start with this simple principle that when I look at the life of Joseph and Mary, they, they did it well. They connected with where he was at. They didn't say to Jesus, hey, 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 you're the Savior of the world. Shape up a little bit, kid. They didn't say that. But we, we put this expectation on our children to understand adult concepts. We try to get them to think like we think. They can't. And I want to give you a little four-step plan today to start this message to being relatable to your children, okay? Because this is very important. If you want them to connect with the God of the universe, first see if you can get them to connect to you. And the way you do that, here, here's step number one, four little steps to it. The first one is lay down the way you think and, and set aside your world. J just say, okay, I'm going to stop for a minute. I'm going to set aside my 50-year-old my world, my 40-year-old world, my 35, however old you are. I'm going to set that aside, and I'm going to think about being seven. If you think about being seven, one of the first things that probably will happen is you'll do this. You'll get down on their level. Because if you want to connect to your children, you don't ask them to come to where you are. You go to where they are. This is just wise parenting. This concept and this idea came to me uh, in, a, in a little bit of a unique way. In my neighborhood, before the snow started flying, and by the way, I don't know about you, I'm ready for spring. But when the snow started flying, before it started flying, I, I saw all these kids riding through our neighborhood on this thing. It's called a ripstick. And I kept watching these kids, and I started thinking, I want to do that. <laughs> so it was about Christmas time. My family said, hey, Dad, what do you want for Christmas? I said, I'd like a ripstick. And my wife was like, what? You want what? I'm like, that thing all those kids are riding. She goes, what are you going to do with it? I'm like, I'm going to ride it. They're like, you're old. Oh, you look, have y'all seen any 50-year-olds in your neighborhood riding ripsticks? No, it's children. But I thought, I want to do that. And it's kind of like parenting. We can stand there and go, yeah, that's what the children do these days. Or we can go, I want, now I'm not telling you to go buy a ripstick, please. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying to you is if you want to relate to your child, you need to go to their world. you got to vicariously envision. I'm going to go over here a second. This is carpet up here, so it's not easy, but I'm going to show you. So I vicariously, I'm sure the video guys, sorry, I'm over here. Um, I started vicariously envisioning myself riding this rip. I would look out the window and go, I can do that. So I got on it, and I thought, I'm going to do this thing. So I, it's not easy on carpet, but I'm trying. And so I started riding this thing, and I started going through the neighborhood. Well, let me tell you something. Women were coming out of their houses clapping when I went down the street. <laughs> They're like, look, kids, come look at this guy. Who is this ancient man? You know what happens now? Kids knock on my door. Hey, Mr. Seaborn, can you ride? Shoot ya, I'm in with the kids. <laughs> How do you, you know, normally 50 year olds walking around children, it's like 911, you know, and me, it's like he's in, he gets us, he's in our world. You gotta envision yourself getting to your child's level, and then once you get there, here's what you do. You say to yourself, what would connect with me right here? When you're working with your 10 year old, what would connect with them? Get to their level. And then this, just do it. The best thing and the best way you can parent is not to say, well, child, let me tell you the word of God says this. That, that's fine. But they're not going to connect with this. They're going to connect with this. 
I'm sitting right here by you, kid. And I was seven one time. And when I was seven, and then you got to try to remember being seven. <laughs> there are some people who can't do that. I don't know why I can remember that stuff. Some of you can't. You'll be like, and when I was seven, I, I was seven. I mean, you, know, you don't remember a lot of it. But if you want, some of you today, parents, this is a big point that I'm sharing in this message. Some of you have a 25-year-old. You might have been more mature than them. Um, but when you're 25, you're not 50. And some parent in here today needs to remember, when you relate to your children, remember where they're at. And Joseph and Mary taught some principles that I want to just give to you this morning. They're very simple parenting principles. The name of this message is Parenting is Tough. Hard message, huh? Parenting is tough. It is. If you're here today and you're in a season of parenting that is just so smooth and so silky, bless you. That's awesome. But I'll bet you most parents in here have some issue they're dealing with with their children that's very challenging. If not, they can pop up anytime. And so as a parent, I want to try to give you some parenting tips from the life of Joseph and Mary that I believe will help you. First one, very simple, is this. Don't allow your children's behavior to determine your behavior. It is so easy to get out of control. I had an email this week from a guy so complimentary, three things on it. First one, this, second one, this, very nice stuff. The third one, can you please help me? Our children, we were on the way to like a water park, an indoor water park this weekend, blah, blah, blah. I got angry in the car and I screamed the whole way there, help me. I'm doing terrible as a parent. I'm taking my children to a fun event and screaming the whole way. I guess they probably don't want to go. That's parenting world. There are parents sitting in this room right now. You would be terribly embarrassed if I could show the video of how you acted this week. Now, you wouldn't allow your children to act that way. But you did. And I want to tell you a story. You can read it later if you want to. It's recorded in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 49. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to read another passage later. But in that passage, Jesus' parents are going to the feast of the Passover. It was an annual trip. They loaded up their carts, and they got their little wagon ready, and they walked for a day, for a day. So we got to put this trip in perspective. It's you getting in your car and driving to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. That's about a 13, 14-hour drive. I know. I live in that area. So I want you to get that. You get in your car this morning, you started driving, and as soon as you got out of the snow, you can make your way down there, and you got to Myrtle Beach. You did the Passover, and then you came home. And you're on your way home. You get all the way here, and you look at your wife, and you say, where's the children? <laughs> That's this story. Joseph and Mary had walked with their friends and relatives and everybody who had left the Passover for one day, and they realized Jesus is missing. He's 12. I don't know if any of y'all have ever lost a child, but it's horrendous. I, I remember one time in a big mall losing our children, one of our children. I mean, you know where they were in the middle of that stinking play, you know, clothes rack in the middle just being quiet. You know where they were. But I didn't know where they were. I was yelling at security, lock the door, lock this door down. Jane's like, honey. I'm like, no, our child's lost. It's freaky. Many of you have lost a child. You get this. Joseph and Mary look around. Jesus isn't there. He's 12. The Bible says they walked back one day to the temple where they walked back to Jerusalem, just the two of them. I'm trying to help you realize how real Joseph and Mary's life was. Do you know the conversations they had to have in a one day's journey talking like that? 
Do y'all know, y'all, any of y'all ever had a 16-year-old and they somewhere and you don't know where they're at and you're riding in the car to try to find them? I can tell you the conversation. If we get our hands on that kid, why would he be so disrespectful and do this? He knows we're worrying. And y'all, remember, we're talking about Jesus. Jesus Christ. All of us would go, I'll take him and my family. I'm telling you, it wasn't always perfect with them either. I mean, I'm envisioning that drive at some point. I'm sure Mary said to Joseph, I thought you were watching him. I'd have thought you'd have watched him a little better than that. Joseph, we might have just lost the Savior of the world. (laughs) And when they found him, the Bible says Mary was astonished. And Jesus said, What are y'all worried about? Why y'all looking for me for? So normal. Jesus was normal. Now, see, here's where I go in my mind, okay? Have y'all ever prayed a prayer and God didn't answer it instantly? You know, about your children. You're like, God, help me. This is Jesus Christ who knew everything, right? His parents are praying. They got a closer link to God than most of us. Don't you think they could have said on their walk, God, can you tell us where Jesus is? Silence. They got to find him just like we did. You'd have thought he'd have had a GPS with him being God's kid on it. And Joseph and Mary, if you look at this story, appeared to maintain control. They didn't like it. They were astonished. Mary even said to him, Jesus, why would you do this to us? Same thing you said. But they maintained control. They got their son, and they continued their journey. I'm sure on that walk, Just the three of them, they went over some new rules we're going to have for you. (laughs) Normal life stuff. Don't look at Jesus and think it always went good in their family either. They had issues. They dealt with stuff just like you did. And watch this. you got to maintain control. And some of you in this room, you're just like Dan Seaborn. You don't always maintain control. I remember, I've shared this before, but I'm going to tell you again. I remember I used to escalate with my children. Guys, I... I can before the Lord, my children are older now, but I just don't lose it like I used to. And I'm going to tell you how I stopped myself because this is what I'm going to tell the dude he wants to meet with me, the email guy that said I'm losing it. I'm going to to tell him what I did because some of you in this room do not have control. And you yell and you scream and you escalate. And that doesn't look like Jesus to your children, just so you know. And I remember with me how I worked on this was uh, my, o- my oldest son, Alan, as he aged, got in the teenage, he's 16, and he was my height, and we would get into yelling matches. We'd be in the basement going at each other. He'd say something, and I'd, I'd up it. If he's loud, I'd yell louder than him. So we'd be like, oh, and one day after all that happened, and Alan left the house, Jane said to me, I was watching all that. It was really hard to tell who the parent was. That's what she said to me. I said, what do you mean? She said, you were losing it. She said, you know, you need to maintain control. So I said to her that day, well, we're, going, we're going to do something new. This is, this is what I said to her. I said, we're going to do something new. I said, um, the next time I'm doing that, I give you permission to walk up to me and say to me, Dan, go to your room. I said, that's what we're going to do. You're going to walk up. I'm losing it. I'm yelling. I want you to look at me and say, Dan, go to your room. So we did this. So Alan and I, wasn't too long after that, we're going at it. We're yelling at each other. We're in each other's face. And Jane walked up. Just, I knew. I saw her coming. I went, oh, brother, she's going to tell me to go to my room. <laughs> she came walking up. She tapped me on the shoulder. She tapped me on the shoulder. I said, yeah, what is it? She said, um, you need to go to your room. You should have seen him. He's like, ooh, pa, got to go to your room. I mean, everything inside me, I'm going to take you down to your room. I mean, you know, it just, ooh. But I had asked for it up front, so I knew it was coming, and I did it. I went to my room. I could hear him out there talking about, Mom, good one. You got him good, you know. <laughs> Fried me. But it put me in a spot where I realized, I don't want this. This is embarrassing. I'm changing this behavior. It didn't take long for me to get control. When you go to your children's level of behavior, You aren't maturing them. They're taking you backwards. 16-year-olds aren't 40 yet. You are the 40-year-old. Act like it. 
Joseph and Mary, I believe, dealt with Jesus, but the Scripture never tells, and they lost it. And I think it would say that. They didn't like it. They addressed it, and they went on. You as a parent need to do the same thing. Another little parenting tip. We're just going to go through several of them. Here's the second one. All, it should be allow, not all. Allow your children to be God-led, not parent-manipulated as they move into their career path. Allow your children to be God-led, not parent-manipulated as they move into their career path. We live in West Michigan. West Michigan is notori notorious for parental control. We like to decide where they go to church. We like to decide them taking over the business. We like to de decide all sorts of things. But I want you to know, Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way they should go. It doesn't, parent, train up a child in the way it'd be really cool if they went. Train up a child in the way that you would like in your family to look later and go, that's what I wanted. Nope. Train up your child in the way they should go. Parents, from the moment they're born, your goal is to raise your children to leave and go pursue what it is God has for their life. Celebrate it. Celebrate it. I have a son who lives in Camden, New Jersey. It's one of the most dangerous cities in America. He lives on a street that he won't even allow me to go outside at night. And when I go there, I look at it, and he, they just had a little child about to turn one year old, one year old Jonah. They don't take him out at night because they don't want him to get harmed. And I'll say to Josh, Josh, is this where God wants you to be? It is, Dad. I love it here. I'm like, then stay right here, safest place in the world for you. You are in the center of God's will for your life. And I'll say to him sometimes, don't ever let me influence you to go anywhere other than the place God has for you. Even if I don't vote yes, go. Because my children, purpose on this earth is not to please their dad. It's to please their heavenly father. Your kids are not growing up in your house to do what you want them to do. They're growing up in your house to be trained to follow after the Lord wherever he calls them to go. As parents, let them go. Don't manipulate them. I think that was a teen started that clapping. <laughs> Number next, the world measures our children by their accomplishments. God measures our children by their holiness. I want you to listen to that. The world measures our children by their earthly accomplishments. God measures our children by their holiness. Let me say something here. I almost put the word goodness. And I was like, no, it's not goodness because there's a lot of good people. It's holiness. It's loving God and serving God. That's how he measures them. I almost didn't put this in here, and I'm going to tell you why. Parents hear this, and too often it turns to legalism. Some parent in here today, I'm telling you, I was scared to put this point in here because you're like my father was, and when you hear it, you run to legalism. They will go to church every Sunday, and they'll do it twice a week, and they'll do it. Stop, stop, slow down. Holiness is not about churchness. Holiness is about godliness. It usually involves great worship in church, as you have here at Res, but it doesn't always put your child in that spot. They may live in a place in the world where they can't get the good stuff they get here every Sunday. Holiness is them pursuing God in their heart, their mind, and their soul. And my goal is to raise children who want to be holy. I wrote a while back this little thing. I was sitting one day, and I wrote the difference between a churchian and a Christian. Because I don't want my children to look at me, hey, Dad, you're a good churchian. No, I want them to say, Dad, you're a follower of Christ. You're a Christian. Look at the difference. Churchians, churchians, that's what I call it, People who focus more on being at church than really living godly lives. Your children are watching your example. I'm, I'm going to tell you this right now. My children watch my example far more than they hear my sermons. 
And I hope that they will always say, Dad wasn't perfect, but he sure seemed to love the Lord Jesus and followed him as good as he could. And that's your job as a parent, set that example. Jesus said, I've set you an example that you should do as I have done. And now as a parent, I adopt that same mode. And Joseph and Mary were raising the Savior of the world, and they sought to be a godly example even to him. Let me just ask you to see which one you are. J just check yourself today. Churchens focus, I mean Christians, I should say Christians focus on reaching the lost. Churchens focus on satisfying the saved. Christians find a way to love the sinners. Churchens love to find new ways to sin. Christians draw people to the kingdom. Churchens draw people to denominations. Christians walk the walk. Churchens talk the talk. Christians get it. Churchens used to have it. Christians live to please God. Churchens live to please men. Christians look at God. Churchens like to look at each other. Christians love the Lord the God with all their heart, soul, and mind. Churchens love the Lord with all their heads. Christians believe in the word, and churchens believe in their own words. I would just ask you, which one do your children see? If you're legalistic, you fall more in the category of a churchin. And I'm just telling you, it's a turnoff to your children. I'm asking you to consider being a Christian. Because Christianity is contagious. Next, teach your children that true greatness comes through humility. Uh, if I were Joseph and Mary, if I were Joseph and Mary, there are seven verses in the Bible that would be my favorite verses in the Bible. If I were the parents of Jesus Christ, there are seven verses that would be my favorite verses. They're in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. It's a book that honors the life of Jesus. I want you to listen As you think about the part that Joseph and Mary played in Jesus pulling off these seven verses. These are probably seven of my favorite verses in the Bible. If you went and got my Bible and looked at it, they're in yellow. I took a yellow marker and I, I, I highlighted them. Because if I can do these seven verses, if I can figure out how to live like this, I will have a huge impact for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it won't involve me. Your attitude, verse 5 of Philippians 2 says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in his appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Are you raising your children in such a way that if the times of this world change and their life of following Christ cost them death by sword, death by martyrdom, death on a cross, could they do it that's the question am i raising them to get higher elevation in this world so that people will applaud how awesome they are or am i raising them to be willing to give their very life if god asks for it joseph and mary raised jesus to prepare him to die for his cause. I believe today um, that I've grown as a person. Um, I do like things about this world. I enjoy things. I try to take care of myself. I do all that stuff, but I hope I'd be the kind of man that if Jesus said, hey, Seaborn, I need you to die for me, I hope I would say yes. And if I will do that, 
then I will set an example for my children that dad is not about dad. Dad is about Jesus. And I'm asking you as parents today, make sure you understand you ain't nothing. Jesus is everything. Live that way. Walk that way. Drive yourself that way. This stinking world can get caught up on you. It can get stuck to you. It can pull you down. Seek Jesus. Be humble. Be a servant. Joseph and Mary were chosen for their position of parenting because they were servants. It's the only way it would have worked. In my life right now, there's something I'm experiencing. The only way it works is because of servanthood. And I'm asking you to consider being more of a servant. And this next one is something that um, the Lord gave me as an insight I want to share with you. I've never heard this little next thought. Something that came to me I want to teach you. Understand what Scripture says when it says your child is a treasure. Is there anybody in here... um, I'm just asking, I've not set this up or anything. Anybody in here have an infant with them, a little, a little baby? Anybody have a little baby you'd be willing to bring up here? Where's somebody? Can I hold your baby a minute? Yeah, thanks. What's your names? What's your parents? What's your names? Josh and Amy. Oh, that's my kids' names. That's hilarious. Now, I don't, that, did we talk before service? It's not set up. I don't know anything about them. Where are you from, Amy? Here, Granville. Granville, okay. You mind, what, what's this, this little boy? Silent. Silas, all right, I'm going to turn him around so y'all can see him. This is Silas. And see, this is where all the ladies go, oh. And all the guys go, why do they do that? <laughs> and tonight during the football game, when Brady throws the TV and you scream, your wife's sitting there going, why does he do that? <laughs> Same thing. Silas is how old? One month. One month old. He's a treasure, isn't he? Is he your first? The third. Third? Going okay? Oh, yeah. yeah Josh, you doing good? You're tired. I get it. I'm sure you find somebody in here to hold him during service. No problem. But I want to, I want, I'll, I'll come right, just stay right. No, stay right there. No, stay right there. I don't want to keep him that long. You're good. Just stay right there. Huh? It's a couple of minutes here and we'll be right back. I'm past this stage. Thank you, Jesus. But anyway, <laughs> Silas, first of all, the lights are bright. He's like, what is that? When you hold this little child in a nursery, you know, at the hospital, when you hold a child, you're like, Oh, this is amazing. This is a miracle. And then you say this in your mind, he's such a treasure. Now, I want to tell you something about Silas when he's two. When he's two, he will have a screaming fit that Josh and Amy will go, there's our treasure standing over there. (laughs) He doesn't feel like a treasure then. But this little child, I want you to understand, at, at the age of of one month and right out of the crib and all that stuff, we always think of him as a treasure. Everybody, everybody wants to hold a one month old. Thank you, Amy. It's really sweet. Thank you, Josh, for letting her come out. I want to hold your arm because I don't want you to fall going down. Thank you. Thank you. Not, Not Silas, but other children turn 16 and become pretty tough. You, some of you have a 16-year-old who's wayward, an 18-year-old, 21 is wayward, probably didn't lay in your bed last night and think, where's that treasure? <laughs> Let me tell you something about treasures, and I'll wrap the message up with this. I, there's way more. I'm halfway through, but I'm going to wrap it up with this because I'm like 10 minutes over. Um, I've been through hell as a parent. I'm thinking my daughter Anna might be watching online right now because she's at work this morning. She told me she'd probably watch. Hey, baby. Anna knows that we went through some crazy hard times and you guys prayed for us, many of you. Anna, I want to just tell you this. I told her this the other day. This isn't new information. What I went through as a parent Oh, my goodness. I texted her last night. We were texting. I didn't, I didn't even know I was going to say this right now. I was texting her last night. What a, what a treasure she is to me. I have learned so much through the pain. 
and she has two. Do you know what a treasure is? Listen to this statement. A treasure is anything that takes you closer to Jesus. Some of you have a treasure that's wayward right now because that treasure is making you draw closer to Jesus. In the movie, The Passion of the Christ, Mary sees Jesus, this little boy she raised, this 12-year-old she had to go get. In that movie, she she rounds a corner. He's carrying the cross on his shoulder. He's dying. He is being beat. And she flashes back, flashes back to him falling when he was five because he fell with the cross. And she remembers a fall when when he was younger. She remembers saying, are you okay? And then she says to him as an adult dying on the cross, are you okay? That boy was her treasure. Hey, hey, let me tell you something about moms. Treasures never go away. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Some of you are going through some painful stuff right now because God chose that treasure to take you there. If, Anna, you're watching by video right now at work, you're a treasure to me. I love you, baby. I told her last night in a text. In fact, I could bring it up. I would say I wasn't even planning on saying all this when I drove here this morning. My text to her last night, my last little one was... um, Always know no matter what, your daddy loves his little girl. She's my treasure. And I can say it more today than I could when she was one month old. Parents, celebrate your treasure. Jesus, we give you our treasures today. Not always easy, not always fun, but always godly. Thank you for teaching us. May we continue to learn. Bless the parents in this room, parents to be. Bless little Silas. I pray he grow up to be an awesome man of God. And I ask, Lord, that today you would help us all to draw closer to you through whatever we face, through the treasures you have given us. In Jesus' name we all said, amen. Thank you.